This epic conference, as you all know, usually takes place in the context of vivid political dramas. I was thinking when we all gathered here about a year ago, Theresa May had just lost her first vote on her Brexit deal in the House of Commons. It seems like ancient history now, but it was actually part of a pattern, and she went on to lose about 25 votes on her Brexit deal. So normally, we are used to exploring the political landscape when the storms are erupting around us. This year is different, but in some ways more significant. We're meeting now in this period which is like a lull before the storms to come. And I've just written a book on modern prime ministers, available in all good bookshops and Amazon, um, where I notice a pattern. It is in these periods of calm, the honeymoon period for governments, that the seeds are sown for future storms and dramas. So if it's okay with all of you, I'll talk about how those seeds are being sown, a bit about the Labour Party leadership contest, if you want to laugh, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions. It, there isn't a clock here, is there? But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll judge it. Um, so, just to give you an example about leadership, some of you are leaders, and how difficult it is even during the honeymoon period. I remember having a cup of coffee with Tony Blair uh, in the summer of 1997. All the commentators were saying Blair is walking on water, and on one level he was. Like Boris Johnson now, he was way ahead in the polls. Like Boris Johnson now, the opposition were in disarray. And I went into number 10 expecting a swagger and confidence and indeed arrogance. Um, and Blair was sitting there having his coffee and he said, you know, you have to take decisions every day as a prime minister. And the decision comes down to this. And I said, oh, what, what, Tony? Do I slit my throat or do I cut my wrist? <laughs> and this was when he was 40 points ahead in the polls. Dilemmas every second of every day. Admittedly, they were a much more contrary to mythology insecure government than the current number 10, which exudes a swagger and self-confidence that I have not met before. Uh, in political, my time in political journalism, about 10,000 years. Um, but it was interesting, during that cup of coffee, to illustrate, this was when the commentators, oh, it's also going so well for New Labour. Um, during that period, uh, during that coffee, Alistair Campbell and Angie Hunter rushed in while I was talking with Blair, and they said, Tony, Tony. They said, what guys, what guys? <laughs> William Hague has just changed his policy on rural post offices. And, oh my God, what do we do? Do we change our policy? You know, there was a sense then of insecurity, dilemmas of unbearable significance. And in subsequent periods, it's really interesting. It's in the book. Um, the, the co I'm an advertiser. The coalition period. It was the 2010 coalition, ancient history again. That first summer, all the commentators, wrong as ever. So look at Cameron and Clegg. Two parties working together. This could last 20 years. Absolutely marvellous. They were taking decisions then that were to lead to their doom. That summer, the decision was taken, for example, to triple tuition fees, the policy that destroyed Nick Clegg and his party. And we, the commentary, will say, is it all absolutely marvellous? And with Theresa May in her honeymoon period, which was huge, she was way ahead in the polls, at last the return of grown-up politics, what a serious-minded figure to guide us towards Brexit. So, in fact, she was taking decisions on Brexit then that were to lead towards her doom. So this is the period, the period when everyone says, oh, look at Boris, he's walking on water, 80-seat majority, that we need to pay attention because the seeds are being sown. And you can see the seeds of future tension, I will put it as no more than that, 
in uh, a range of things that are happening almost as we are sitting here today. You can see it, for example, in the decision on high-speed railways. Within number 10, as I say, there is this extraordinary exuberance and self-confidence. Some commentators have compared it with early Blair, but Johnson is stronger than early Blair because Blair faced Gordon Brown at all times in the Treasury, whereas Johnson at the moment is almighty. His chancellor will be told what to put in the budget, whereas Gordon Brown told Tony Blair on the day of the budget what was in it. Um, so he is omnipotent. He's got Dominic Cummings, who is a campaigner of deranged brilliance, um, also with him. Uh, Johnson is not, Johnson has a capacity to like people, but he's an odd mix of exuberance and extrovert performance and a kind of awkward shyness. And he hasn't got many friends in politics. He hasn't got many who he admires greatly, which is why he's already conducted one brutal cabinet reshuffle on the day he became prime minister and is about to conduct another. For sure, by the way, you'll have a new culture secretary and almost certainly a new business secretary within days. February the 14th, I think, Valentine's Day is being planned for this brutal reshuffle. But with Cummings, Johnson admires him. I'm told when Cummings comes into the room, he looks at him as he might, how can I put this delicately, um, uh, a, a female who he might be interested in for all kinds of reasons. I mean, he, doesn't, he, he just admires Cummings. He thinks Cummings was the key architect of Brexit. And he is one of the few people, Cummings, who he listens to. But not always. In the end, it's the elected leader that is accountable. And Johnson, we've got to build what's over here, infrastructure. Blah, blah, blah. So he's given the go-ahead to HS2. Cummings thinks it will be a catastrophe. And Cummings will reflect that here is an example of the impotence of the advisor. However glamorous the role, in the end, it's the elected figures who take the decisions, and he will become frustrated. I would put it at no more than that, but I remember watching closely the relationship by Cameron and Steve Hilton. Steve Hilton now in California, swimming and, you know, freaking out. Um, but Steve Hilton, when he went into number 10, said, oh, Steve, this is all going to be so cool. We're going to be able to change Britain. We're going to have vegetable cooperatives running everything, you know, sort of wacky ideas. And when Cameron stopped them, the tensions began. And he's now not speaking to Cameron and vice versa. Who knows what will happen? These aren't predictions, but you can see the tensions. Hawaii. Tory MPs worried about security. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee re-elected yesterday, Tom Tugendhat, warning about this uh, decision. But Boris Johnson, at his most imperious might, thinks again, uh, Britain, forward, uh, uh, 5G, 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 and has taken that decision. But the really big one, is the trade talks uh, with the European Union. Now, where you stand on Brexit, uh, we won't go there. But what is unquestionably true is that while it was a brilliant advertiser's slogan in that December election, no, no, let's get Brexit done, oven ready, in the microwave. By the way, how is something that's oven ready then put in a microwave? <laughs> uh, it sounded as if he was going to overcook this. Put it oven ready in the microwave. Well, the metaphor sort of works because they're about to put it in the microwave because the trade deal is going to be epic. And it won't be quite as vivid as those knife-edge commons votes that happened as we all gathered here, not here, somewhere else in January last year. Um, but they will be of more significance than those commons defeats and so on over the withdrawal bill. It will affect all of us. Um, and the timescale 
is like something out of Monty Python's Flying Circus, for those of you who remember that absurdist, brilliant comedy. It is not a year, actually, of talks for everything, uh, as we just heard, services, goods, the whole shebang. It's much less than that. The talks won't begin, probably, until March. They have to be ratified by all the EU parliaments. So the assumption is the talks would have to end by October. Now, the EU, as we all know, takes August off, and if we're honest, July and bits of September as well. So that leaves about 25 minutes for these trade talks <laughs> to be uh, conducted and completed. And that will not happen. It is literally impossible. However, there is, I think, no appetite in the psyche of Boris Johnson to contemplate a no deal, coming out with nothing. And by the way, he has to decide in July whether to ask for an extension to these talks, and he's promised not to do so. Look at how prime ministers become trapped during their honeymoons. Honeymoons are dangerous, political ones and probably real ones. Um, and so we're in this extraordinary situation where the most that can be achieved through these trade talks is a cosmetic trade deal by the end of December, with lots more talk to come. So in other words, when we all gather here next January, I think it will be in the midst of epic drama again, because we will know what stage these talks, which will affect everyone in this room in all kinds of ways, will be at. And if there's no deal, which I don't think there will be, we will be in chaos once again. That cliff edge that everyone feared would be back like some film noir of terrible proportions. If it's a cosmetic deal of limited significance, on and on it will go. And this isn't a prediction, because I don't make predictions because everything I predict goes the opposite. Um, but it is trade that has always caused tensions within the Conservative Party. Uh, from the Corn Laws onwards, Conservatives split over trade. Now, I'm not saying they will this time, but I am sure there will be tensions that aren't evident in this calm before the storms to come. Finally, on the Labour Party, um, it looks as if... Oh, there is a clock. Brilliant. Um, on the Labour Party, it's very interesting. They're about to elect a leader of the opposition. What is so interesting about leaders of the opposition is how few go on to win a general election. In modern times, since the early 60s, only three have been leader of the opposition and won elections. Harold Wilson in 1964, Margaret Thatcher in 1979. Uh, Heath did it in 1970, but he was slaughtered in one in 1966. Um, and Tony Blair in uh, 1997. And those three big winners as leaders of the opposition, were, had one thing in common. They were political teachers. They constantly, and this is where all, all of you come in, they constantly addressed the question most leaders don't address, you all do, which is the why question. Why should they be elected? Which is, in effect, the essence of advertising. Why is a campaign a, a, a product worth uh, clocking onto. And that is the key. Thatcher used to go on and on about my father's grocer's shop in Grantham. He never spent more than he earned, and a country can't spend more than it earns. It's absolute economic nonsense, but brilliantly accessible. Making sense of her monetarist policies. Blair used to say, look, guys, we're the radical centre, all right? That's why you should vote for us. Those who wanted change were excited by radical. Those who wanted reassurance by the term centre ground. It kind of, all these things raised quite, and Harold Wilson used to go, we will harness the state for the white hot heat of the technological revolution. Oh, that sounds so modern, exciting, and all the rest of it. 
you have to answer the why question, your question in your sector really, to have a chance of winning. And that should be applied to the Labour candidates in this election. And so far, but it's very early days, none of them are in a position to address that why question. And if the winner doesn't, the winner will lose next time whatever dramas, and there are going to be many dramas, erupt around the more fragile than it looks Boris Johnson era. Thank you for listening. Let's have a couple of few questions. What's the time? Okay. Uh, what have we got? Five minutes. Uh, who'd like to ask a question? If there are no questions, I'll carry on talking, but there usually are lots of questions. Who would like to ask anything? God, this is a challenge. I've never had this before. Uh, okay, no questions? Yeah, the, at the, uh, the guy at the back and there. Who do you think will win the Labour contest? Who will win the Labour contest? Well, all we can do is look at the evidence, and it looks in a way, very surprisingly, if someone had told me a year ago Keir Starmer was going to win, I'd have been very surprised on two grounds. Uh, one, that I thought he would be disqualified as a man, and because he's not a Corbynista. Um, and I thought that the membership would want someone uh, like uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who, by the way, isn't a political teacher. It's very interesting. So Keir Starmer, it looks as if he's going to win it quite easily. We'll see. Um, Jeremy Corbyn is fascinating. He aroused this idolatry for a time. The, oh, Jeremy Corbyn chants and all the rest of it, which incidentally I'm told he found very embarrassing and awkward. Diane Abbott told me the only reason he travelled around the country to all these rallies was because he liked train journeys. Um, <laughs> he didn't actually like the rallies. But, he, but for someone who was seen as a potential orator, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't one of the teachers who answered the why question. And the Labour Manifesto is, uh, from December is a real illustration of that. Hundreds of policies crammed into a document as if that is an explanation into itself. And of course it isn't. Corbyn never answered or even had tried to address the why question. Keir Starmer, if he wins, will have to or else he will lose. Uh, I think there was a question... Uh, uh, there was one there, and then we'll go there, and then I've got to stop. Yeah. Um, I suppose my question is about um, credibility and the impact of... Well, from the outside looking in, it feels like the Labour Party at the moment is, is not really a credible option in terms of coming into power and, and being in government. How much do you think that impacts sort of how shaky Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are going to be sort of over the next 12 months? Because there's obviously going to be a lot of upheaval and a lot of yes. difficult situations, but the fact that in most people's minds there's not a credible alternative puts him in a better position, would be sort of my thought. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you're right, although if Keir Starmer were to get it, there are issues he will have to address in terms of legal equalities, but he will be utterly forensic. I mean, he is a lawyer who will forensically scrutinise Boris Johnson, and, and Boris doesn't like scrutiny. If you notice, he avoids all uh, tough BBC outlets, etc., etc. He will get scrutiny. The other thing I would say is after the 1992 election when Labour had lost for the fourth time in a row, everyone said, well, that's it. And they were in power again in 97. Now, that's not a prediction, but it does show how things can turn if a government starts to get things wrong. Now, I say it's all ifs. I'm not making any predictions. But I don't think it's by any means guaranteed that... Uh, Boris Johnson is in for 10 years. He may well be, but it's by not any means guaranteed. And that tough agenda out, I outlined is just an early example of the mountains he has to climb. Maybe he'll pull it off. Uh, uh, there was, yeah, the front row, second row there. Um, hi, Steve. I, uh, my name is Mimi Turner. I work in um, business strategy. And I was really fascinated by your um, honeymoon analysis. And it reminded me of something I was reading recently about weirdly, um, the Trojan Wars, and a phrase that really stuck in my head, which I uh, think you were talking about, was inevitably um, the true origins of the Trojan War arose from a disagreement amongst the gods. And I was wondering, within the firmament of the 
buoyant and perhaps even arrogant conservative party, who do you think has the power to be a god? And which are the disagreements, which gods are going to trigger the disagreements that we spend the next political cycle examining? Well, that's an epic question. Um, <laughs> the clock says I've got 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I would say at the moment is that uh, uh, number 10 does, I think, feel godlike, although I think Johnson has agonized over these dilemmas I've explained. And at the moment, there are no competing gods. There aren't big figures. Uh, Sajid uh, Javid in uh, the Treasury is a weak chancellor, as say, compared with Brown taking on Blair and so on. So there are no alternative gods at the moment. But gods emerge... Uh, when differences become pronounced painful and the authority of the God Prime Minister starts to become undermined, as inevitably it will. And so there are differences over whether free markets and a smaller state are the way forward post-Brexit. Some of the Eurosceptic right want that. Uh, compared with those who say we've got to keep these North of England seats, that means huge spending, huge borrowing, huge amounts on infrastructure... Johnson appears to be in that position. Cummings does, but in a slightly different way. And those tensions will surface. And gods will emerge to articulate that alternative point of view. So as ever in politics, there will be times when a prime minister who appeared to walk on water is sinking. Whether he sinks or not in, within five years, I'm not making any predictions. But for sure, we are in the calm before some epic moments with gods on all sides in the coming months and years. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>